Hello, I'm Carl Eulen Helverson, and you are watching Living Green on a Blue Planet. Living Green on a Blue Planet is a uh, program on Fort Wayne Access Television. It is also um, by the same title found in YouTube, and it is also uh, utilized in a green blog called Carl's Green Blog. So the focus of all of this is on everything green. Uh, it's very clear that uh, we're having a, a crisis of generations uh, with climate change. And it'd be easy to be overwhelmed with the uh, changing temperatures that are extremely high or dry um, or cold and wet uh, of uh, climate refugees and uh, conflict over limited resources and extinctions of plants, animals, and the destruction of environments. So it'd be appropriate to be upset, depressed, maybe discouraged. But it serves no good purpose to allow ourselves to be immobilized. And so the focus of the program is on solutions, and solutions that are found by people and systems and organizations uh, at the grand level and at the micro-individual level. And so the grand level might be policies, international organizations that are working together or addressing issues. Um, but the uh, more local would be the individuals who are doing the research, who are finding solutions, who are uh, being green in their own homes. And so that's the focus of the program. For the next couple of episodes, we're going to be following a local woman who uh, is making a big difference. Right? Um, having a ripple effect on so many different people. And this is uh, Carrie Vrabel. And Carrie is um, a very smart woman. She has a master's degree. She's been a librarian. Uh, she's uh, studied in a number of different areas. Uh, she's creative. She's a musician, an artist. Uh, she's compassionate. She cares about animals, all different species. Uh, and she's motivated. She's kind of like a, a local earth mother. And what we're going to be following is her contribution in terms of wild foraging. Now, Carrie's been interested in nature since she was a, a little girl. And uh, that interest just continued to grow and grow. And she did a one-year internship in Illinois uh, where she learned all about foraging and uh, followed uh, plants through their whole life cycle for a year. And so she takes a pretty cautious approach to what you pick and put in your mouth. Uh, you know, she wants you to know what you're looking at, and so she provides recommendations for guidebooks so that you can look at wildflowers or trees or shrubs, uh, mushrooms, uh, and, uh, and she says, when in doubt, don't eat it. Uh, in some cases, don't even touch it. And so uh, if you're pretty sure, but you haven't seen it flowered yet, she'd recommend you still don't eat it. You wait till it flowers, and if that means that you can't eat it till the following year, that's okay. Better to be frustrated and waiting and alive. Okay. Uh, so she, uh, she is cautious in that way. She's also um, licensed or certified in Indiana and the state of Michigan as a wild mushroom identifier. So she's got lots and lots of skills. I first met her at Fox Island. This is prior to the Duratio. So sort of like Carrie in Paradise. Uh, and uh, it was in the fall, and she gave this tour to people. She gives these hiking tours that are lectures, classes, and camaraderie. And, uh, and so if you can just picture the smells of nature, the beauty of nature, the sounds, the birds, and then learning stuff. And then at the end of uh, each of her hikes, she pulls out a thermos, and she, has, she offers us a drink of a tea, of one of the plants that we were looking at. It's just a nice way of combining everything. So I saw her first at Fox Island in the fall, and then I saw her again in Fox Island in the winter. Now I'm a master naturalist, but I'm a new master naturalist. And so when I identify trees, I say, that's a tree, it's got bark. But she can look at trees in the winter when there's no leaves, and she can tell you what kind of tree it is if there's any part of it that's edible, and if there's any part of it that's edible in the, the winter. And so um, I saw her twice there, 
and we'll see that in terms of slideshows. But in terms of video programming, uh, we're going to see her also at LC Nature Center. And uh, that was the only time that we were walking in the woods and you'll see people kind of doing this because uh, we were the, not the only ones interested that day, so were the mosquitoes. Uh, but she gave us some really good tours where she showed us the um, Queen Anne's Lace and uh, Wild Hemlock and how similar they are and one is edible and one is very toxic. Okay. Uh, she, there was one of the walks where she actually gave us two different um, drinks. Uh, one was a, a sweet tea and one was savory, could almost be used as a broth. So that was really pretty neat. At the end, um, we were a little distracted because she's really interested, interesting. But if you've ever been to LC uh, Nature Park, you know that there's also a herd of elk and a herd of buffalo. And those are pretty cool. It could be a little distracting. So we saw her there. We also saw her at Eagle Marsh. And Eagle Marsh is this 800-acre restored wetland that had been a, um, a, a cornfield. And it was restored to a wetland. And so there are parts there where you could eat the plants, but other parts that were preserves and you could not. And so she gave us a, a hike through there. And then finally, she uh, gave us a hike in uh, Channel Lake State Park. And so different environments, different plants, uh, same process of uh, identification. And so we're going to be following her. And, uh, and then the goal eventually is to meet her in studio uh, and uh, interview her because she's also uh, currently working on a book. So um, hope you enjoy it and see you on the other side. Peace. But um, that's, a, that's a, something you could play around with. Um, 
Okay, that's, those are the main uses for Queen Anne's Lace, AKA Wild Carrot. The main thing is this is the, the danger lookalike for poison hemlock. So the Queen Anne's Lace was not native, um, right. but I wanted to show you that so we can hold it up to poison hemlock so you can see the, the difference. Poison hemlock's also not native. Um, but the black locust was native, the hackberry tree that I mentioned is native, and um, this beautiful plant is called yarrow. Achillea milliforum um, is the scientific name, and it is also native. And it's um, and it's nice because it's growing near some um, Queen Anne's lace here, so you can see, well because mine's getting kind of sad, mm -hmm. but um, it. Let me hold up to. The only real lookalike would be Queen Anne's lace. So yarrow is on my is in my left hand, and Queen Anne's lace is here. Mm -hmm. um, Queen Anne's they're both hairy. Um, and the main concern would really would be if you would mistake yarrow for poison hemlock, um, which usually poison hemlock, the leaves are a lot bigger, but you never know. Situations can, I mean, these leaves are getting a little bigger. So, um, so the cool thing about yarrow is, although there are some people who you, who use this very sparingly as an herb in cooking, it's typically not really considered an edible as much as a medicinal and a first aid plant. Um, and what's cool about it is that, um, it's an amazing, it's like a wild styptic or a blood stopper. So you know like when you take your dog and um, to the vet and have his nails trimmed and then if they nick them, they have that Q-tip with the stuff they touched on it and it stops the bleeding really fast. So that's a, that's a styptic and this is a, like a wild version of that. So um, there are a couple ways to use it. You can chew it up fresh, which I won't, I'm not sure if it's been sprayed over here, so I'm not gonna do it for you guys, but usually on my walks I'll chew it up and then I spit it out and put it on the, it's called a spit poultice, um, which is a little gross, but it works. <laughs> so like if you're camping and you get a cut, and like a, a shallow cut, nothing like a crazy deep thing that you want to go to the hospital for, but um, you would chew it up, spit it out, and then maybe put a Band-Aid or a bandage over it to hold it on, and it will stop the bleeding really, really fast. Um, so that's a way to do it in the field. But a cool thing to do, um, I have one of, I have a man who's taking my classes and he's um, making, building a wild first aid kit and giving them to his friends. It's really sweet. Oh. Um, and so you can actually dry these leaves and um, once they get really dry and brittle, you can just crush them up into a powder and then keep that powder in a nice glass jar and it keeps forever. And then you've got a powder styptic that you can use, again, even better than the spit poultice because it's less gross. <laughs> you can just sprinkle some on a cut, you know, and then mm -hmm. put a bandage over it and you're, you're set. Um, so those are, and I will say too, like I said, the scientific name is Achillea milliforum, which I'm pronouncing wrong, I'm sure, but Achillea refers to Achilles, and the story goes that Achilles would carry Yarrow in his pouch into battle so that when his soldiers got injured, he would use the Yarrow to stop their bleeding, stop the bleeding of their injuries, which probably didn't do much. <laughs> that's the way the story goes. Um, they do create really beautiful white uh, flowers that are clustered together at the top, which again, to the untrained eye, might look um, Queen Anne's lacy. Um, so again, you just want to make sure. Um, I think the leaves are really uh, distinctive. Um, they're much finer and more feathery mm -hmm. than that of Queen Anne's lace. Um, but neither plant, as long as you don't pr uh, confuse it with poison hemlock, you're it's it's okay. <laughs> um, but that's why you always want to get your ID right. Um, some people do take it internally as a tea, so they'll usually, typically the flowers are used for that, um, and they're typically dried, although they can be used fresh, and usually it is for, um, you know, women, like, to uh, lighten menstrual blood and things like that. It's a, it's a blood stopper all throughout the system, but there are a lot of contraindications for people who have issues with blood clotting and things like that, so just be super careful if you ever would take anything internally, medicinally, um, from any plant, but definitely from yarrow, uh, it's just something to consider. This is probably one of the most practical plants I can show you because I would bet money that every one of you has this at home in your yard. Um, so this is a plantain, even though it's not related to the plantain that looks like a banana. It's like a really weird coincidence that they're both common names like that. Um, it, Plantago is the genus, so that's you can call it Plantago if you want to sound fancy. But um, we have a native plantain in uh, Indiana, but uh, a lot of the plantain that you see, we, there's also a, a 
species from Europe, and that's the most common one that you see in, in yards, and that's probably what this is, or probably maybe some hybrid of the two. Um, but it doesn't matter, they're all edible. And um, I make a uh, chip out of the older leaves like this, like how you would do kale chips. Um, they're really good. Like we just had them at Eagle Marsh last mm -hmm. weekend, and everyone, like they were gone. People just eat them up. They're really easy to make. Um, the way I do them, so these older leaves, just if they're in your yard, as long as your yard has not been sprayed, so I wash the leaves gently, like rinse them, and then I pat them dry. And I probably say maybe 20 in a batch because that's how many you can fit on a baking sheet. Unless they're, these are enormous, so maybe like 15 of these. <laughs> um, and I, I just coat them really lightly with olive oil and sprinkle them with salt and lay them out on parchment paper and cook them for eight to 10 minutes at 250. Um, and also I have a Facebook group called Wild Edible Indiana, um, you guys, um, I have this re recipe and some pictures on that Facebook group. If you search plantain or plantago, you'll find it. So if you want a refresher, but um, they're really good. They just get really crispy. You just don't want them to burn is the only thing that matters. Um, you can also eat these when they're really young and tender. The issue is when, as they get older, see these veins on the back? they get really stringy, like worse than celery. Like they're just miserable. So people don't usually eat them raw when they get this big because of the veins on the back. And the flavor isn't quite as good when they're older. But if you make a chip out of this, it would be fabulous. And you don't just, you can do any seasoning you want. I just use salt. Um, and the other thing that's cool about this plant is that it's another first aid plant. So just like yarrow. Um, so this one has more edible properties than yarrow does, but it's just as good first aid wise. So you can chew this up, just like I said about yarrow and spit it out and put it on a uh, bee sting, on like a not severe burn, <coughs> um, sunburn, things like that. It's got poison a soothing ivy. property. Poison ivy, That's yes. That's I use it. Oh mm -hmm. good, yeah. People make a salve out of this. Mm -hmm. um, so that man who's doing a first aid kit, he's did, he did a salve of this and um, in his kit. And um, Shakespeare mentioned it in Romeo and Juliet because in Europe, it's long been known as a first aid plant there. And so the he mentioned it, um, he had, I forget who he was talking to. I'm going to butcher this, but he said that um, something about how his shin, his friend's shin was scraped, and he said a plantain leaf could heal that, and it could, it maybe even could heal your broken heart because he was his friend was sad. Um, but it's just known so commonly, even even to Shakespeare, as a as a healing um, skin plant. So it's cool to know that it's growing in your yard. And, and that's um, all this, right? Yeah, all of these, all, all these plantain. Yeah, and you really look for these distinctive uh, veins if you're ever worried on the back these distinctive veins that grow almost parallel to each other that's your ID there's nothing else that looks like it if as long as it's all of the leaves are basal only right so they um, they come straight from the ground there's never a stem that they branch off of as long as they're all basal leaves and you see these veins then you're you're good um, full size and then harvest them so these prickles on these sweet little gooseberries um, you can see they, there's really nothing you can do to get rid of these unless you have the patience, which I do, which I have done before, to actually pull each one of them off <laughs> and then eat it raw. Um, when they're green like this, they're gonna eventually turn purple. When they're ripe, they turn purple. When they're green like this, they taste kind of like rhubarb, like they're real sharp. And so when you make a pie with the green ones, which is what my grandparents did, um, it's a rhubarb pie kind of vibe. But I like it when they turn purple and um, when you eat them raw purple, they taste like kiwi, like exactly like mm. kiwi, they're so good. Um, and then they make a much sweeter pie. But the problem is a lot, and I think that's why my grandma picked them green and why a lot of people, there's a culture of picking them green is that by the time they turn purple, a lot of them have been eaten by other animals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, that's kind of, if, if you have a way to like fence it off, then maybe wait till they're uh, purple. But, um, but yeah, so people make uh, jams and juices out of these mostly because there's just, to eat them raw, you gotta deal with the prickles. They never get soft. You could boil them forever and the prickles would still hurt to, you know, to eat and swallow. So um, that's a little gooseberry. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you guys may have these on your property. They're, we're gonna see more of them, but I just want you, this is a really good way to, if you've never seen prickly gooseberries before, it's, it's really cool. These are good examples of them. So. Oh. These are wood nettles, and we're going to talk a lot about nettles today. We're going to see both types. We're, this is wood nettle, and we're also going to talk about stinging nettle. Um, they, so wood nettle and stinging nettle are both edible, both native. 
Um, wood nettle, if you notice, you see these hairs? Wood nettle is even more stingy than stinging nettle. See the hairs on the stem? Those are the hurdy, stingy nettles, or the stingy part of the plant. Um, and notice that the, that the leaves on wood nettle are alternate. And we're going to look at stinging nettle, and those are opposite oh. leaves. Mm. So that's an easy way. Also, the, the leaves are egg-shaped, and stinging nettle leaves tend to be long and sort of lance-shaped. Um, these are a really delicious uh, edible vegetable, basically. So what we do is they're getting a little old now. Ideally, they'd be a little smaller, maybe like a foot tall, and you eat the shoot and the leaves. You cook them, of course. For cooking them kills the sting. Um, but wood nettle is eaten as a vegetable. Um, stinging nettle, there's other stuff we do with it, and we'll talk about it later. But wood nettle is a good forager's veg staple vegetable in the early spring. I just wanted to point that out because we're going to see both kinds. So. Okay, so these are May apples. A lot of you might be familiar with them. They are a native plant. Um, they are mostly toxic except for one thing. You can eat the fruit that May apples make. And right here, this one is just starting. You see that little oh, nub me. there? Yeah. Mm. So it was started as a flower, and then it's created. And we'll see more of those as we walk, but I want to point them out because this is a nice group of them. Um, so the mayapple fruit is only edible when it's totally ripe. So it's going to become green. It becomes maybe the size of a golf ball, maybe a little bigger. And it'll first it'll be green, and then it'll turn like a very pale yellow, and it should just fall off in your hand. If you eat it before it is ripe, it will make you sick. <laughs> And you must not eat the skin or the seeds. <laughs> I know, it sounds like it was not true. But if you go to all that trouble, um, it tastes really good. It's really, really tasty. It's, it's, it is a sweet kind of apple, honey, apple kind of flavor to it. A lot of people end up making a jam with it because they can use a food mill to get rid of the seeds and the skin, and it's just easier. But in the field, if you're really careful, you can get the skin off and kind of move, you know, get the seeds out with your hands and actually eat the pulp raw. So you can do it either way. Um, one thing I have to tell you about the, my favorite thing about May apples, I think, aside from the taste of them, um, the main, one of the main animals that eats May apples are box turtles. And oh. if you think about box turtles walking under these, mm -hmm. and then they would come up on a fruit that would be like bigger than their head, and they can just eat the whole thing, and it tastes so good, and that's their life, and that <laughs> makes me so happy. <laughs> so all, every time I see May apples, I just picture these happy little box turtles <laughs> roaming around, <laughs> eating enormous, like, Did you see this? <laughs> but just to refresh your memory, these are wood nettles that I pointed out earlier down here. Um, but I wanted to mention this guy because it's every you've probably been noticing this as we've been walking. Um, this is anise root, um, and actually it's growing next to sweet Sicily, which is furrier. Um, but both of these are considered sweet roots in the category of sweet roots that are native to Indiana. Um, they you can eat the entire plant, the root and the leaves. Although now it's getting older, so it's going to seed. And these are these real spiky. They end up being these brown spiky seed pods that used to always get caught in my dog's. Fur. Um, they're like spears, like they get stuck in their skin. Oh. So um, the entire plant tastes and smells like black licorice. So um, let me take a leaf and just kind of crush it. And you can't do it until you crush it, but crush it up and smell it, and it should smell really licorice y. Um, crush it and pass it around. I'm mm -hmm. oh, sorry. <laughs> and um, did you get the anise root, the black licorice smell? Mm -hmm. So it's just a good one to know. Um, here's some, if you want to take these and pass them, just crush them and pass them down. Um, so that is, there's also in this, in the early spring, you can dig the root and it's uh, similar to like a wild carrot, to the size of a wild carrot, and you can eat it like a wild carrot. It does, the root does not taste super licorice-y. I wish that it did. Um, and um, I like to eat, before it flowers, I actually eat the flowering stem. And like, it's really sweet. I just crunch it in the woods and it tastes really good. It's like candy. Um, OK, so that's anise root. Did everybody get to see that? Yeah? Um, now, right next to it is wild ginger that I'm standing in here. This is all wild ginger, these heart-shaped leaves. And um, is it OK if I pull a stem so they can smell the ginger smell? Um, so wild ginger, whew, mosquitoes. 
they create these, see how it runs along the ground? These rhizomes. Oh, yeah. So that's the part that's edible. So I'll just break off a little bit. And you just smell it, and you can break a little bit more off it because you use the smell. But it smells like just ginger. It smells like the ginger we get in the store. So wild ginger was used by the Native Americans. It's another beautiful native. Um, it was used to cook with, to season food. It was used sparingly. It was used as a seasoning. <coughs> Same exact thing with the sassafras. Um, recently, they have done studies on um, the the ginger and have found some carcinogenic properties and so it's the same thing they give now they say beware that it could be carcinogenic foragers typically eat it anyway based on the Native American history however the history is that it was used sparingly so nobody was eating bucket loads of this stuff um, so that's just a, a good thing to keep in mind if you want to experiment with wild ginger my uh, mentor uh, made a wild ginger and red bud cake that was magic she would dry she dried the ginger and used it um in, in baking and it was it tasted so good so um, there are a lot of cool things to do with the wild ginger but so wood nettle anise root and wild ginger three native delicious edibles there we have so elderberries um with edible are just two things the flower the flowers are edible but you don't really want to eat the flower stem it comes it like comes up in a cluster and then it has these stems that kind of come down from it and meet, and meet at the middle. So a, the most traditional thing to do is to make like a fritter. You lightly um, put a, like lightly bread it basically and then um, fry it kind of like you would a, I don't know an elephant ear or fr you know fritter. We'll put lemon in it to kind of go and maybe a little sweetener and if you want to make it like savory it makes a really good broth if you add mm. some kind of like salt to it. So it's right it's walk in the middle of that so just be prepared it's not going to be sweet like the sassafras was so excuse me. Um, <coughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> we'll get our assembly well, line back. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> this is poison hemlock and um, you can see I brought my poor sad little Queen Anne's lays. Um, is the leaves look almost exactly the same? Well, they did when I, this was okay. <laughs> but um, especially when it's a baby. I mean, look. You might just think that's Queen Anne's lace. Yeah. But if you look at the stem, look how hairy Queen Anne's lace is, and you look at the poison hemlock. There's no hair on it no. at all. And some of them have purple splotches on them, but some of them don't. And over here. Yeah, there's a. Here's some with the yep. purple. It's not poisonous to touch, right? Uh, it is actually oh, okay. slightly, so I would not touch so it. Not yeah, don't touch it. What? What? Like yeah. would, you, would you just get a rash? You can get a rash, but you can also. Um, there have been reports if you handle it enough that some of the toxins can go through your skin. Oh wow. Um, so, so that's poison hemlock, and it has no hair on it versus uh, Queen Anne's lace that is very hairy. See the difference there? Mm -hmm. So just keep in mind, and they grow in the same areas, and um, you know they can trick you. Just as a review, this is stinging nettle, and this is jewelweed I'm standing in. Oh, okay. I thought they like traveled like I don't know. But we and we got a fence. Well, I know they came across that. I thought that they like covered like a. They actually do. Oh, okay. They actually do. Okay. Uh, this is just. Oh, there's a baby. Oh, there's a baby. Yeah. This tiny. Oh. Uh, so right over here, you guys. Um, just I just want to mention this is our native black. This is one of our native blackberries, Allegheny blackberry. That's in flower right now.